Welcome everyone to today's presentation on calculating custom rates. I'm John Hewlett, Farm and Ranch Management Extension Specialist at the University of Wyoming in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics. Started off this presentation with the question of, you know, just what do we mean by custom work? Uh, and there are lots of different types of of uh, custom operators we used to survey with the machinery cost survey was called, uh, which included folks that did uh, machine work. So it might be like custom excavating or other kinds of uses of a, of a specific machine or machines in, in uh, complement with uh, various kinds of implements. And, uh, and as well as a number of different kinds of custom services that people provided. So it was seed testing and other kinds of laboratory services, uh, as well as auction yards. I mean, there's a lot of different categories on that survey. With this, what we're really trying to talk about is what it might cost to do, uh, to either operate a specific machine and as a standalone operation, or if we ran it in, in uh, conjunction with uh, another implement or harvesting equipment, et cetera. So to get at that, we're really thinking mostly about the cost of, of the machine, obviously, but also the fuel and then the operator labor that would go with that. And then if we have any operating inputs that would be used, so if we're baling, obviously be baling twine, but uh, you know, if we're actually spreading fertilizer or some other kinds of field operations or maybe a, a substantial uh, component tied up with uh, operating inputs. So those are sort of the four main categories we're thinking about there. And I guess uh, another question that goes with this as you start this conversation is what is fair? Of course, you get different opinions from different people depending on where you are in the, in the situation or what your past experience might have been. Uh, you might be thinking that fair represents one of these choices, which ranges obviously from I want to get the highest price to now I'm looking for the best value uh, or I might be looking for fast service or, you know, uh, fewer complications or uh, somebody that's more independent than, than uh, others that might need further input from me. Uh, but in many ways it hinges on this last point, which is <laughs> depends on which side of the situation you're on, whether you're paying for it or if you're the one that's providing the service. So, a lot of things to think about there when you start asking about what is a, a reasonable rate or what's fair. So we start that at sort of at that point and then begin the discussion of what should we include? Well, obviously we need to, to include the various costs um, that would that we're going to incur. And the first category is pretty clear. It's going to be the machinery costs, certainly going to be an operator that could make the machine uh, do what we need it to do in the field. Uh, again, the operating inputs, but we also need to think about uh, a return to management. If we are the uh, owner of this custom operation service, for example, uh, we may not be the operator out there on the machine, so this operator labor may be paying somebody, uh, an employee or somebody to run that machine, and um, and so there's some difference there in terms of, you know, it's not necessarily you, the owner, that's running that machine. Uh, but in every case, if you're the, the one that's providing the service to your customer, uh, you are taking risk as the custom operator. So it's only re uh, reasonable to expect there'd be some kind of a return to you, uh, both in terms of the capital that you've got invested, but also the risk that you have involved uh, in offering that service. So. That's another charge that, that goes sort of over and, and above what uh, you might think of as you were the owner of the machinery doing the work yourself in your own fields um, is a return to that management. And uh, we have a chance to enter that in the software, but it's, you know, it's kind of, again, hinges on which side of the, uh, which side of the question are you on? Or, you know, if you're, if you're the one receiving the service or if you're providing the service, and if you're providing it, there are, there are a number of things that you might approach in terms of setting this rate in a little different way than if you were just a, a, you know, a farmer looking to use their own machines to accomplish the same thing uh, on their own fields. So if we think about actually estimating these costs and what goes into it, there are a number of challenges. 
I think you would agree. And probably the biggest one is trying to decide what we should include, but more importantly, where should we include it? So the one, the costs that are most easily arrived at are the ones that um, we call operating costs or variable costs, uh, the ones that are most obvious because we typically are writing a check to pay for these or um, they're sort of at the top of our minds as operators because they tend to vary with the level of, uh, the level of use. So whether it's the number of uh, folks that we're doing this custom operation for or the number of acres that we're getting over in a particular year or over a particular month, um, these are the ones that are going to vary. Uh, the most. And so operating inputs, we've already kind of mentioned, obviously fuel, but if we're running over lots of acres, we're going to have to stop and and uh, change oil every once in a while. And we have to grease uh, often. And so lubrication costs are are estimated within the software and typically for these types of, of software uh, or even done by paper applications, you typically do uh, lubrication as an estimate of, as a um, percentage or an, a, a tie to the fuel cost itself. Uh, repair and maintenance, obviously those can be pretty expensive uh, cost. It's a category that's somewhat challenging to, to estimate if you don't have previous field experience. Um, <clears throat> and so that's a category we need to make uh, use some special care in trying to estimate estimating not only in terms of the parts and so on, but certainly if there's labor involved in that, or again, in the, in the sense of maintenance, you know, are there certain things that we have to do after, you know, so many hours of machine operation or so many acres of coverage? Um, so, so, and we'll talk a little more about how we estimate that, but there's a lot of things that can go into that. Uh, clearly, labor in terms of operation uh, labor, but also the labor to perform either refueling and lubrication services or uh, repair and maintenance services, lots of labor can be tied up over and above just the hours uh, operator sits in the seat and, and uh, makes the operation happen in the field. And then uh, finally, if we're, as a lot of uh, owner operators do, have to borrow capital to make this uh, work, but a custom operator may also need to do that, borrow capital uh, to actually pay for these operating items, then there would potentially be an interest charge on that uh, total out outlay of, of uh, capital for, for the uh, operating inputs before you might actually get paid for the service. And so um, there, we estimate a, an interest charge on those operating inputs as, as a group of costs as well. This category is the one that's probably the most intuitive again, because you're typically paying for them fairly often through the season, uh, they're, they're more top of mind. The ones that are more challenging are, the, are this list, which is the, the list of ownership or fixed costs. We call them fixed as compared to variable because they tend to be unchanging over time. So, you know, if you've got this investment in a specific set of uh, tractors and a certain set of implements and so on, you know, they, those costs probably don't change very much in this category. So the first item being taxes, well, if you've got personal property tax on that machinery uh, complement, then, you know, that's what that tax uh, component would, would be including. And that's probably fairly obvious, but you can see that that probably doesn't change from one year to the next uh, all that much unless you're actually switching out machines or something. Uh, the housing one uh, is really a charge that's assigned for housing. So whether you've got a building over it or if you try to you know, cover them in some way. And I've had people take, ask about this, well, what if I don't store them inside? Well, concept is if you don't store your machines inside, that they tend to not last quite as long. And so there's a charge one way or another uh, as to you know, the, the loss in value or if you actually cover them and, and try to protect them so you get a little more uh, useful life out of them that there's, it's costing you one way or the other. So housing cost is assigned uh, insurance. Next category we're thinking about 
maybe not so much uh, loss of use or other kinds of insurance that I think some people actually consider using, especially if you're doing this as a you know full-time job as a custom operator, you might think of something along that line. But typically, we're thinking about fire insurance or some other kind of of uh, loss in that sense uh, for an insurance cost. Uh, depreciation is the one that folks really don't like to talk very much about. Maybe the easiest way for me to, to understand it uh, is that if you think about a particular machine, so let's just describe a tractor, um, rolls out there on the field, ready to do some work, the depreciation charge is the is the idea that that tractor is only good for so many year, hours of of useful life, so many hours of use in the way that you're planning on using it. Um, that does not necessarily mean that it has zero value when you're done with it. So there can be a salvage value, and for people that get you know fairly sophisticated about trying to evaluate the actual depreciation cost, you would use sal you would take salvage value off that initial value and then allocate the remaining cost across those uh, years of life. If it's years uh, you want to use, if you want to use hours, uh, a person can use hours. Uh, there are different ways to look at this, and I guess I'm, I'm not so caught up on that particularly, but I am really concerned that we use depreciation in calculating the cost because it's my experience that this will typically add up to about a third or potentially more of the cost of doing one of these kind of field operations because those machines, you know, they don't stay, especially if you're doing something like a custom operation uh, as a, again, as a full on service provide to, uh, providing that to other folks in the area, whatever, your machines just aren't going to last as long if you're putting lots and lots of hours on them. But what I'm going to present here and what we've included in the software comes from the Society of Agricultural Engineers. So it's folks that, you know, make a profession out of helping to not only design new equipment, but also helping people to understand what the cost of owning and operating that equipment might be. So that's what the basis of this software package is. And if you find other uh, software that's been authored at other universities and so on, that's how they're basically going to calculate these different costs as well. A lot of people misunderstand what depreciation is really trying to do. Let me move now to my describing the long-term interest cost. And then we'll come back to address that a little more specifically. So as you see, we have the last item there in the list is long-term interest. And that's different than on the left, we have interest on the operating inputs. Why is that? Well, it's a different loan, and you guys are probably quite familiar with this. Uh, in your example, Blake, you're talking about a specific asset that's being purchased and you're paying interest on the loan tied to that. If you had to borrow money to, um, to fuel up and lube that, uh, that vehicle, or, or even worse, if you had to change the motor out, right, and some big repair expense, so you had to borrow a little money sort of as an operating loan to keep that car functioning, you would see those basically as two different loans, right? Mm -hmm. And in farming, uh, that's typically the way it's done. However, when you borrow money to buy, say, a tractor, when you repay your loan each month, or it might be some other schedule, but probably every month uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, what you're paying back is not only paying some of the interest charge, so that would be the long-term interest cost there, but you're also paying down principal. And this is where people sort of get mixed up, is they get this idea that somehow making that payment is tied to depreciation. That's not true. Uh, they are separate things. So when you're paying the, the loan payment, 
the principal portion of that loan payment is simply put giving back to the bank what you have already borrowed from them. Yep. Okay. And the interest that you pay is the price, if you will, or the charge that you're you're happy to pay for having had the use of that capital for that period of time. Depreciation, on the other hand, is a recognition that that car, or in this case, a tractor, is wearing out as you use it so that it no longer has the productive value that it once did, like the day it rolled you know, onto the field ready to go with, with that you know, shiny paint on there, and now it's three years old, and wow, we sure have put a lot of hours on this thing. You see, it's, it's that kind of recognition. So if instead we were talking about it, uh, instead of a tractor, we call it a pile of money, <laughs> And we put a stack of bills out there in the field and every year that we used that tractor or that pile of money, we had it available and we took some of it away and just said, well, you know, we used some of that up. Well, it's a little easier to maybe imagine that that pile would be gone after a while. Uh, similar sort of thing with the tractor or if it's a, you know, big baler or whatever uh, we might be talking about in the way of machinery, that's the concept is that if you keep using it, at some point, it's gone, or it's down to that salvage value, which might be no more than a scrap value, and we now need to get a new one, because, you know, each time we start it, it smokes a lot, <laughs> or whatever, right? So another way of thinking about this uh, difference between fixed and and variable cost is to think about how if we look if we look at the level of activity varying across the, the, the x-axis here, so as we move out, a lot more activity, the fixed cost really doesn't change, right? And the cost is basically where we'd read off at the y-axis. Uh, if we then add to that concept the variable cost, which basically is going to increase, and it might not be a linear relationship, it could be a geometric, but as we use it more, we expect that it's going to increase uh, in terms of the total cost over time. So variable cost and then couple that with, a ver with the, sorry, variable cost and fixed cost added together are what we are estimating to come up with the total cost of, in this case, it might be, you know, mobile board plowing for somebody. Um, we got to figure out what the total costs are in order to estimate what that cost per acre or what the cost per hour might be, and then again, what the rate might be that's reasonable to go along with that. So that I'm just kind of waving my hands and saying, this is how those different costs um, as individual components add up, variable and fixed cost, and that we would expect that they're gonna change as we increase the level of activity. Again, it's just a kind of, uh, is a conceptual slide We've talked about these machinery costs, and we've we really have jumped over a lot of different concepts there really quickly. Um, but they are the more difficult ones to estimate, and that's where the software comes in. Obviously, we would also include these other uh, costs we've categories we've already talked about in terms of the inputs, the labor, and the return to management to come up with a a, a total cost. And with that said, it sounds fairly simple. If you've got some good software, boy, <laughs> it would seem like maybe it would be easy to do. And yet there still are, as there are a number of things that have to go into this in order to make a reasonable estimate. And the bulletin outlines the various kinds of cost categories that we've just kind of briefly discussed, as well as how one would go about es uh, estimating those if you're gonna do it uh, by hand. And it includes within it, the, in the appendices, these different tables that I've mentioned, although the electronic version also includes those tables. So what we're gonna do now is, is kind of uh, run through how this might be used. We have these different uh, categories you can see on the screen, anywhere from powered equipment, which would be, you know, it could be something like a self-propelled sprayer or might even be a self-propelled baler. Uh, to certainly a swather or a tractor that we're going to tie on to some other kind of implement. Um, but we can define that. We can also uh, define up to three different implements if we wanted those to maybe be joined together with a power uh, unit as a field operation. 
But it will also, uh, Blake, if you want to, you can plug in your numbers for your car and actually estimate the cost per mile for vehicles. So it could be, uh, you know, tandem trucks or other kinds of uh, um, hauling um, vehicles that we have and use of uh, for various different reasons on the farm or ranch. Uh, we have also included some capacity in here to estimate the cost for powered irrigation equipment as well as non-powered irrigation equipment uh, based on requests. So um, that may be of some interest. I don't think I actually delve into those different, every one of these different categories all that much through this presentation, um, but realize that the thing can do quite a bit as far as estimating the various kinds of costs uh, for different sorts of ag equipment in addition to tractors. And then the final, uh, the final uh, category there is the field operation costs, and that's basically where we take these different uh, equipment items and put them uh, in the field and tie it with some other parameters to estimate the cost uh, either per acre or per hour for operating it. What we have on the screen with this slide are the data that we basically need to estimate the cost. In this case, for a powered uh, piece of equipment. So we have it named as a wheel tractor. Obviously, you can name it anything you want to, and it's got options there as just a textual description to help you keep track of what it is we're trying to estimate the cost for. The next item on the screen or on the list there is the purchase price. And I can't overemphasize this enough. Uh, that Purchase price is the number for which all of the costs are then based. So it's really important to get the purchase price to be the number that is as good a number as you can. If, we're, if we were a custom operator and we really wanted to estimate these costs for our machinery complement, as we're doing these types of uh, field operations that we offer with our business, the best number is our number, the one that we paid for this tractor or that we paid for the various pieces of equipment that we're tying onto the tractor or as we're, or if we're running, you know, again, self-propelled equipment, so on and so forth, this, the number should be the number we pay. We don't, we don't really want to go and look up some other number unless perhaps uh, we wanted to use the software to estimate the cost of operating, say, a new machine versus the one we're currently running, in which case, obviously, the software could be used for those purposes, too. But again, the, it basically, all the costs are going to be estimated using this purchase price number. What the dealer quotes you or what they list on their web page may not be the number that might be the closest number you can come up with um, if you are looking at new equipment, for example. But if you have machines that you're negotiating with the dealer to bring onto your place, you know, you might get a, a lower rate negotiated. They might throw in transportation or you might have to pay transportation cost, get the machine to your place. There's I, so obviously there is a, a host of different kinds of numbers that might be tied onto that base price number. Uh, just like dickering on a car, oftentimes there are these different kinds of dealer options with uh, farm equipment. So it's important to try to get this number to be, again, reflective of what you're actually paying to get that machine into the field and, and uh, functioning. Uh, we have a the next row there lists the year quoted. So sometimes what we're trying to do is price out what would it cost to run, you know, my equipment complement as a custom operation, say for the neighbor. In which case, if this tractor really was, you know, five years old or or even older, uh, we might want to make note of that with this year quoted so that. Again, the price, uh, purchase price, should go as, correspond to that, but it may um, maybe a further description of exactly what it is we're pricing out here. So that's kind of what that's all about. The rest of these things, 
um, and and I don't I don't have a slide that actually shows all these different cost factors and so on, but basically uh, these these different factors and in the software it's got these question marks as you can see on the slide you can click on for more information um, and it basically gives you a description of what should go in there. Uh, the I buttons that you can see on uh, here for cost factor two and for the repair factors and then down here at horsepower, if you click on those, they actually pull up a, a tab within the software that um, is the, that basically is the table that you would need to look these up in. There are other tables that aren't necessarily linked here too and I, <laughs> Uh, so this presentation isn't like one that steps through every single detail that you'd need to do. I, I guess I'm trying to keep this at more of a conceptual level. If you guys want to go there, we can pull up the software when we're done and, and kind of walk through that. But, you know, we, you're right. These, these factors are not something that people are going to carry around in their head, um, but they have been estimated by the ag engineers. So to fill that out, we basically make a, an estimate of the total number of hours of life. So 12,000 hours is not an unreasonable number. Um, uh, annual use is about 1,000 hours. Uh, that's not all, all that unusual, but the, the two numbers going together there are suggesting you know, a number of years of life. Uh, maximum life, as said, is 20 years. That's probably way more than you would estimate for a typical farm situation. If you're going to use it at a thousand hours a year, it's not going to last 20 years, uh, very likely, without some heavy duty repair costs, right, to replace or repair uh, major components of that machinery item. So there's, there's some things there that we might actually want to change depending on how we're planning to use it. Uh, but then there are these three different cost factors that the engineers provide repair factors, again, depending on the type of machine and uh, the level of use, they make recommendations for those at different levels. Uh, the opportunity cost rate, which is the interest rate we're charging on our operating items, uh, taxes and insurance, uh, typically estimated at something like two and th or three percent of the cost uh, per year. Uh, fuel price, uh, and we're using here is $3.50. Prices have come down a little bit on fuel. Uh, PTO horsepower is basically a rating either by the by the manufacturer or it could be Nebraska test rating as to what that power unit should put out. And then the percent load factor, which is an estimate of on average, what is the load on that machine uh, for those 12,000 hours of life. So obviously you don't you know, run it at high loads all the time. So in order to try to better estimate, you know, what the fuel use would be and corresponding lube costs, um, that's what that factor is about, is to try to estimate uh, on average what that load might be on that motor. Okay, let's move on then and look at what making the estimate might actually do for us. If we click on the button uh, that's Still up, visible up there at the at the top right of that um, data entry screen. It says view results, and if we do that, we basically generate pull up this table, and it is telling us that. Um, so it repeats the factors there at the top, as well as giving us some estimate of the fuel consumption rate there at the bottom left, and uh, bottom right tells us what we're estimating as far as oil consumption or. Uh, in terms of gallons per hour. It also tells us what the uh, interest rates are, which we didn't enter directly, but again, the software is giving us back <clears throat> that information. And so that table, basically with the colored areas at the bottom is, is, the, is sort of the key. Uh, we estimated we'd use this about a thousand hours and that we would probably get rid of it in about 12 years or 12,000 hours. So those Two points on the left uh, sort of preface then the table items on the right. Annual cost is the total cost per year. So it gives total cost, basically 51 or rounding up $52,000 a year. Uh, a lot of that coming from, dep from depreciation, which is about 10% uh, of that cost. 
our opportunity cost or interest charge, taxes, housing insurance or THI, our repair cost, about $8,000, pretty substantial amount, and then fuel cost, again, at $3.50 and running this thing at 60% uh, load uh, at 8.2 gallons per hour. And so those are the those are the the numbers and how we've broken it out for the annual costs. Uh, then those are divided by the 1,000 hours at the left to estimate the cost per hour of operating that machine in the field. That's basically what uh, software does in terms of estimating the cost of a machinery item. So if we move forward with that tractor and then we have a mold board plow, I think we're going to join with that. We can go to this uh, estimating the the field cost, operation cost is what the label of this tab is. And we fill out the information uh, here about the about that field operation. So <clears throat> we need to provide more information about the, the, the machines as they're tied together uh, in order to estimate those costs. So in this case, we estimate at the top there the width in, term, in feet, so seven and a half feet with this plow, uh, the speed, so about four and a half miles an hour, and then a field efficiency uh, estimate. So that's trying to get at overlap and you know headlands and some other things about that. Uh, the tabs, the buttons there at the right, again, the question mark or the I tab, or now we have a, a table tab, uh, allows us to pull down additional information in the software about these different rates. Those three rates taken together imply a, an accomplishment rate of 3.5 acres per hour. And it is that number that we use to convert between the cost per hour or the cost per acre is that accomplishment rate. Um, and I think I do provide a table so let's see here, yeah. Uh, so here's an example it's labeled table five. It's listed and is provided in the software, is also an appendix in the, in the uh, print, printed guide. But if we were interested, for example, to know what typical field efficiency rates were or speed rates uh, for different kinds of field operations, again, this is provided by the ag engineers. So we can look down here to mold board plowing and see that you know it ranges from 70 to 90 percent efficiency or typical of about 85 percent uh, range of speeds anywhere from three to six miles an hour or about 4.5 on average. So it gives you some uh, again other information to help enter stuff for yourself. Uh, you may know you know if you actually were doing this kind of work yourself or uh, or a customer operator, you might be able to ask them, you know, how what their accomplishment rate is, and they could tell you some things as far as you know making some calculations uh, that may differ, you know, depending on again the type of machine and and the type of soil condition, especially for plowing. Um, but you can make some estimates here by adjusting these rates. Um, so obviously, mobile plowing, we don't have any operating inputs, but we have a section there uh, for entering up to four different inputs. So if we've, uh, if we are spraying, for example, we might have the actual uh, chemical we're applying, and we might have some carrier or you know some other kinds of uh, additional components we're putting out on the ground. We can put in a description as well as the uh, the, number, the amount per acre as well as the cost on a per acre basis. So or it says per unit basis. So the two multiplied together are going to give us a cost uh, per acre that then gets added into this machinery operation. Uh, operator labor, we have that defined uh, as the next category there. And then a return to management. So all of those items uh, are necessary to calculate the cost of an operation in the field. Um, the last section there is a risk analysis section, which uh, we'll look at here in a minute. Another component that's included both, again, in the guide and in the software is a set of results that shows up as this table. And what this is is a, is a compilation. As we've done the custom rates. I was involved in doing the custom rate survey for I don't know, 
10 years, something like that. I forget now. We, I think I did it four or five different times. We did it every couple of years, maybe six years, six different bulletins. But, but in the latter years, what we did is modified the survey to not only survey on the rate that people charged, but we also asked them to tell us how they accomplished that custom operation. So we collected from them in their responses the size of the power unit and the size of the implement and then how many acres that they could accomplish in a 10 hour uh, period. So we took all of the, and I think it was three different surveys and the results from that, that we pulled together and, and created this table that's in the software that shows a range of rates and an average for those different, um, those different descriptors. So again, this is from people responding to the Wyoming Custom Rates Survey. And so maybe you know, a little more closely tailored to uh, conditions that we see in Wyoming. I don't know, I haven't spent a lot of time comparing it to you know, the Ag Engineer tables, but that's what's in there is, is a, a table that lists various kinds of tillage as well as harvest operation variations. So in mow board plowing, for example, in the toughest conditions, we can see that um, people have reported using anywhere from 145 horsepower tractor up to 300 with an average across all of those uh, individuals that responded to that particular question of 184 horsepower. Uh, plow size of anywhere from four to 10 bottoms on average six and uh, accomplishment rate of anywhere from 10 to 50 acres per 10 hour day uh, on average 27 acres, uh, which translates to obviously a 2.7 acres per hour. Right? So again, that's kind of a powerful feature as something that I had wanted to report in previous versions of the printed results of the survey, but uh, we weren't able to necessarily get it out in this form. But it can be really helpful in terms of setting up, you know, what would a custom operator, you know, be typically looking at? And again, this is from Wyoming operations as opposed to that egg engineer data and some of the other tables. The problem comes, though, in that if you look at this table, there's quite a variation there. So, for example, as I've just talked through the mold board plow description, if we took this uh, rate for heavy draft, for example, plow only and deep plowing, and we put that together, well then we'd, we'd, uh, we actually comprise three different kinds of operations. If we were gonna you know, actually make the estimate in the software and somebody was asking us, well, what's the custom rate? Should I be charging for that heavy plowing? Well, we could use the one on the left, which is essentially the average. That's 180 horsepower tractor, six bottom plow, accomplishing about 4.5 acres per hour. Or on the right, you can see we, we had a low range of about 110 horsepower tractor with a four bottom plow, not doing more than one and a half acres an hour, or all the way up to what's probably uh, you know, a weed operator in the southeast part of the state with a big 300 horsepower tractor, 10 bottom plow, and accomplishing 15 acres an hour. Well, so we can run that in software. That's the beauty of the software. And um, <clears throat> so if we take that average operation, uh, I stress the point of, of the purchase price pretty heavily in our discussion of what goes into estimating the cost, that becomes a really important factor on the page uh, tied to this at the Right Risk website. Uh, we've created links to go to the various manufacturers of the different ag equipment um, that we were able to locate and that provided purchase price information. So we could go and look that up uh, for various items. In this case, we're gonna look at 180 horsepower tractor and a six bottom plow to try to get a reasonable estimate of a new price for those two items and bring it back into the software. So what we did to pull that together is we actually averaged purchase prices across, I think it was three different manufacturers of 180 horsepower tractors and six bottom plows, so we, we aren't biasing it by green or red or yellow paint, it's 
just <laughs> Uh, trying to come up with a reasonable kind of average price for the tractor and the plow. And so given the average component on the left, you can see almost two hundred horse two hundred thousand dollars tied up in the tractor and nearly forty thousand tied up in the plow. And then we've done the same thing for the smaller um, complement on the right as well as the the really large complement. So using that information, then we can go into the software, enter the enter the appropriate uh, purchase price along with the other uh, cost factors and useful life estimates, and come up with an estimate of how much it cost for the 180. In this case, the table shows the values for 180 horsepower tractor and a six bottom plow. Tractor being used on we're estimating a thousand hours a year. Plow being run 100 hours a year. And you're probably, if you're quick on math, you can see we're actually going to use the tractor more than the plow. You say, well, all I do with this thing is plow, plow, plow. Well, okay, so you need, you would need to change the number of hours on the tractor if that's all you're going to do. What's that? What's the logical consequence of that? It's going to end if we reduce the number of annual hours of use to 100, then the total cost of, of that tractor is going to be allocated to only 100 hours instead of 1,000 hours. So it's going to increase the cost per hour substantially, like a factor of 10, right? So a person has to be really careful about the assumptions that they're putting in here as to what's going on. But if you had a 180 horsepower tractor, you're probably going to use that to pull some other implements. Or if it's your own farm, you're probably going to use it with, again, harvest uh, or maybe even livestock activities that go well beyond the plowing. So that's that's why there's a difference there. But if uh, a person needs to really take a look at that, as well as the years to trade, and this is where we've got that coming back in the table, but it's tied to that total hour, number of hours of useful life, is where that number comes up, because that's governing how we're allocating the cost of the machine as we estimate in the software out. Uh, to, on a, uh, to the per hour basis. So we sum these uh, two sets of number, two rows of numbers, for, again, for the tractor and plow, and at the bottom we can see what the cost is uh, on an annual basis for those two items put together. So again, if we're doing other things with the tractor, you know, the, a portion of this tractor's cost would need to be assigned to, again, if it's a harvest activity or uh, other tillage operations, um, we, we would be allocating it out. But if for the portion, well, the total cost basically is 50000 uh, almost $51,000, right? And we're going to divide that by the hours that we're planning on doing, in this case, would be plowing, 100 hours. Uh, or we'll use the accomplishment rate. We can see down in the lower left there, four and a half acres per hour to try to, to come up with how many hours we're going to spend uh, doing plowing. So that's the place where we start. You might just kind of note that how much uh, of what is being allocated here. Largest portion, as we've already mentioned, is fuel costs because uh, fuel prices at $3.50 in a pretty large tractor uh, at a 60% load is going to generate a pretty high fuel usage uh, and the corresponding fuel cost. But you can see depreciation and repairs are coming out roughly to about 22%, so almost a quarter, certainly a fifth of the total cost of operating. And uh, and so if fuel costs weren't, weren't quite so high, I think you'd see if, that uh, those two categories would be a higher percentage uh, of the total cost of of owning and operating this particular machinery complement. As it is, it's roughly a fifth between those two and then operating interest in taxes, housing, insurance, making up the balance. That's kind of how that breaks out, just to make that point. To come up with the accomplishment rate of 4.5 acres per hour, and looking at the six bottom plow, we basically have, we will have nine feet of operating width, uh, running it at about 4.9, miles per hour, and I think that's the one we use to balance this out to about 4.5, but at an 85% efficiency factor. Uh, 
Um, point being to get to the 4.5 is what we need to do in order to estimate what the cost of this custom operation would be that's listed in that table. Okay, hope you guys are following me on that. <clears throat> but yeah, if we put I'm that good. in the in the yeah, we'll put that in the software, and then basically within that field operation section of the software, we can click and say, "Show us the table," and we get this corresponding table, uh, which shows both the tractor and the moldboard plow. Top table being the cost per acre, the lower table being the cost per hour, and we sum those across to the right, getting the total cost, and then uh, including the uh, operator. We could have operating inputs there, but we don't have any in this plowing case. So operator labor, though, and then a return to management gives us a total of about $25 per acre. Or using the 4.5 acres per hour, we can estimate the cost per hour. Uh, sorry, that's how we get the 25. It's basically taking the cost per hour and, and estimating a cost per acre. Uh, the total cost per hour, though, down in the lower right, is $113 per hour to run that tractor and this plow and complement together. So again, it's fairly straightforward math once we have that total cost as estimated in this table, and uh, coupling it with again with the, getting the the appropriate field capacity estimate, and then the uh, operator labor we use $15 an hour and return to management about $10 an hour gives us this set of tables. So that would be the cost for the custom operation, $25 an acre. Um, but remember, we also had those faster and slower or bigger and smaller kinds of operations. And uh, we could then make estimates for those. So the 180 horsepower six bottom complement at the top, the smaller 110 four bottom uh, complement here in the middle, and then the 300 horsepower 10 bottom complement at the bottom. So if you look out there at the right, it's got, or I guess it's the left hand number next to the dash, we've got $25 per acre for the 180 or average complement, the small complement about $50 an acre, or $12 an acre for that really large tractor and plow combination. And then it seems to me the question you'd want to ask is, so which one is the correct rate? It's all plow heavy draft, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so if somebody asks you, what's the custom rate? <laughs> what would you tell them? I mean, you see a custom operator, if he's smart, would estimate these costs like we've just talked through and then allow for that last bit in terms of variable field conditions and then charge some reasonable rate, right? So that you don't have to change your rate from one customer to another. So the point of this is to show that there is a great variation. If we look at large, which we're not surprised to see that be the lowest cost per acre, we're covering a lot of acres pretty quickly, right? $12 versus 50 at the smallest complement size, and then, well, the average falls in there somewhere around in the middle range at 25 bucks, right? Um, and, and remember, I didn't just like do some kind of a factoring here. I actually went and looked up list prices for, for these different tractors and these different plows. So, you know, there's a little, there's some, there is some, uh, economies of size and, and scale possibly tied up in those purchase price values as well as maybe some of the factors that we use. There's a, a host of things that vary between what we've got on the screen here besides just that they're big, middle, and small, right? <laughs> it's, it's sort of trying to point out that it varies for lots of different reasons and these estimates incorporate all that into a sort of a bottom line cost per acre or cost per hour. So what do people actually charge? Now, again, the values that we're estimating with the, the numbers on the left here is repeated are estimated from new list prices. There was no attempt to slide those around in time. The most recent custom rates guide though was done several, quite a few years back now. 
And if we look here at moldboard plowing, uh, heavy draft, we can see that for dryland areas, they were charging uh, $13 an acre. And for irrigated areas, about $27.50, $28. And there's a range of rates that, again, custom operators reported. Um, if we look at the irrigated areas, probably where we're most likely going to buy this service is anywhere from $25 to $30 uh, an acre. And you would assume, I would assume, that that probably ties to this average rate, by average operation we've estimated $25 for. Again, there are different, there's probably a fairly dramatic difference in list prices between the, the rate in the table versus the, uh, versus the one we calculated. But it just goes to show that you know there is some correspondence. Uh, the rate that they were charging at that time basically was a was a rate that was higher probably than the cost of the machinery, uh, and well, higher than the cost of the complement we've estimated. In other words, they probably were throwing in a factor like we just mentioned for variability in soil types or other kinds of things. So you could call that a return to management. They basically had some additional charge in there, it looks like to me, <clears throat> without going back and you know, actually digging in uh, with the list prices for, for several years ago. Um, that would be kind of what I'm reading in the table. But I just wanted to point out that there is some kind of a congruence really between what we estimate with the, with the software and what we see in the table. You can also see that where they've got a heavier, you know, soils or heavier turning uh, old alfalfa or with their breaking sod, the rates are ranging up from, on the average basis, 31, even $34 per acre. So, you know, they're, they're actually uh, uh, reflecting more fuel use and probably harder conditions on the machines um, in a higher rate charge for tougher conditions. So next point is a lot of people don't do plowing. I said, what if we, uh, what if we did another kind of, uh, let's look at custom baling. So if we, we said, well, what if uh, we take a small square baler, fairly typical operation, although becoming more rare these days, and tried to estimate the cost for uh, baling only, uh, which includes, and the rate would include uh, wire or twine, depending on the type of baler. So again, small squares, um, the, the equipment that was uh, used was on average an 85 horsepower tractor with a small square baler accomplishing about 3.4 acres per hour. Um, can't even buy a 15 horsepower tractor, so I had to bump that up to a 30 horsepower tractor uh, that I tied onto this small square baler accomplishing one and a half acres an hour. Or a 115 horsepower tractor uh, uh, able to get across five acres an hour. And uh, so you can see that, again, I, I priced out the tractors and I priced out the balers across uh, several different implement dealerships or deal, uh, manufacturers, sorry, from their website, calculated an average price, ran it through the software, and those estimated um, costs are listed below there. So we have, uh, again, the question of uh, the, the average complement is basically $22.70 uh, per acre or $73.60 an hour, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Or if we assume two, two acres per ton or 60 bales per acre, sorry, that should be two tons per acre. That's, that's what we were assuming, 60 bales per acre. So I was assuming... 30 bales a ton, so that's not written correctly in that footnote. So it's basically two tons an acre. Uh, we can then express the value as dollars per bale or dollars per ton. So $11.35 a ton for the average operation, 20, a little over, well, just under $20 per ton for the small uh, accomplish or complement there, or for the large one, $10 uh, per ton. Now. I guess the, the first thing we'd notice, there's not as much variation as there was with plowing, but if you look at the tractor sizes, we're not really varying those all that much. 
and it is in fact the same baler. So the plows actually were larger plows in each case, or smaller. And uh, so there was some variation in machinery costs, whereas we're only seeing really differences in the tractor uh, and the fuel use that goes with that in terms of the accomplishment rate. So we don't see as great a variation. But if we look over here to the uh, to the table again, we can see that people were reporting uh, for bail only somewhere in dryland areas $15 or anywhere between 12 and 15 or an average of 13.50 a uh, ton for bailing. Well, again, 2006 is quite a long time ago, but but uh, 13.50 is not all that far from 11.35 per ton. And again, like plowing, you know, if you have if you have three quarters of a ton per acre or only a ton per acre, there's a lot of difference than bailing a field that's got three or maybe a little stronger uh, tons per acre of standing forage out there. Um, it has a, you know, not only changes your accomplishment rate, but also has a different kind of wear and tear on your, on your equipment. The question of course is, so which is the right rate, which is correct. And then I guess another point I'd make to you guys, I haven't yet, Said this, but these cells that you can see in that table that are shaded yellow, the reason they're shaded yellow is because well, we didn't get enough data for the 2006 survey to update the rate. So we used the rate from the previous custom rate survey, which must have been something like 2002, 2004, something along that line. Uh, that, at that point, you know, tried to try to focus our attention on developing. Uh, a newer version of the software to allow people to more accurately estimate the rates for themselves. So using that data and going back to that field um, operation cost tab in the software, in the lower left we can actually build in risk analysis to allow what we can see here a series of different factors to vary. So it could be depreciation cost, opportunity cost, Taxes, housing, insurance, repairs, fuel and oil, uh, total operating input costs or operator labor or return to management. So we can allow any one of those factors to vary in this analysis. So again, this one's for bailing uh, uh, with a small square baler. We're gonna choose fuel and oil. And you can see there to the right that, what we're, that the estimated fuel and oil charge was $10.53 per hour. And we estimate that uh, that might be low. And so what we've done is put the estimate of low and high around that. We say that it probably won't go any lower than $10, but it might go quite a bit higher. And again, we're, we were in a period of time where fuel prices were varying quite a lot. So maybe as much as $21 is roughly twice what the most likely estimate was. So again, um, if a person's gonna use this a fair amount, you need to understand that the low and high, when we put the low close to the average, or the most likely, and the high somewhat far out, we actually are entering a skewed distribution. It's kind of skewed out there away from what would be more, more typically thought of as a normal distribution, which centers around the average, right? So this software takes into account your estimates like that and automatically, gives you um, the ability to kind of tailor it to your what you really think is going to happen in in terms of the costs that go along with that so using these values we run the analysis and it gives us a distribution that looks like this uh, and this is what you call a cumulative probability distribution and if you're not familiar with that basically what it's doing is including all 100 percent of the possibilities out there described within this curve. And uh, the, this curve is listing field operation costs per acre covered at the bottom. Uh, yeah, cost per acre, and then the probability on the y-axis. So if you, uh, in the software itself, you can run your cursor along the curve and it'll read off various points. Um, but I've listed three of them here that are kind of most in interesting to us. So the cost per acre that we estimated for the uh, for the average complement was twenty two dollars and sixty nine cents an acre. 
So given the fuel and oil costs are going to vary, uh, we can we would expect then to see that the the cost would go no low twenty two dollars and fifty three cents an acre on the low end. So we basically have a hundred percent probability it's going to be above that. Or reading at the high end, we basically could go as high as twenty five dollars and twenty cents an acre, and we expect basically there's a hundred percent chance we would fall below that. Or if we read off at the 50, 50 percentile uh, point, it's $23.05. So basically, we're saying it's about a 50-50 chance uh, that it will, would fall above or below that particular point. So it's kind of the point of, of the middle there if you want to try to get a feel for that. So again, our estimate was $22.69 uh, for fuel and oil. Uh, that showed at $10.53 per hour operation charge. Uh, and if we let that vary, then this is what we could would expect. And so again, it's a way of, of kind of doing what if analysis and, and yet it also ties probabilities to it. So it's not just telling you that the range is something, but it actually assigns a probability given your range of estimates as to what we think is most likely to happen. So there's some really powerful kinds of, of uh, possibilities there, I guess, if I had that rate listed there. The point of this is that if somebody really wants to you know, get a handle on what do we think going forward as well as the a solid estimate of what are my costs today, uh, the software is probably the best way to do that. But it does mean you have to spend a little time and you have to enter the numbers that go along with the equipment complement that you're intending to operate. Or if you're looking at buying a new one, it might be a little easier because you can look it up off, off the web page. So the software will give you the tables uh, in terms of the you know, discrete estimate of the cost of, say, the, the, the tractor and the plow or the tractor and the uh, baler, uh, both stand alone, so how much they cost to just own and operate them with generic assumptions, or if you tie them together, it'll help you to estimate the cost uh, for that field operation or a harvest operation. And then if you want to dig into that and say, well, what if we allow some things to vary, uh, then it can use this uh, sort of a probability analysis approach to help you see what kinds of changes you might expect if there's one or other factor uh, from that list that you think might might could change over the over the coming year or over the life of the machine. So with that, um, I guess I'd point out that in the guide uh, that comes with the with the downloaded software, the guide's in there. If you if you want to take a look at that, there is an example that walks through. Uh, again, it's a moldboard plow example, but it it kind of walks you through the entries for those. And uh, does, does does also provide the uh, probability analysis. Um, and in addition, there's this handout I guess I gave uh, you all that that includes another example. And in this case, it's looking at hay harvest uh, using a self-propelled windrower and calculating the cost and doing the uh, probability analysis tied with that. As another example that you could you know sit down with the software and kind of enter some numbers for yourself and and kind of work with it to see whether or not you're coming up with the same results there's two different kinds of examples that again uh, we put out there that you could use uh, sitting in your office besides a presentation like this so with that um, the comments that i was going to offer regarding the software and how it works what's behind it in terms of the rates that it estimates for various kinds of machinery and equipment. And I guess I was going to stop at this point. If you got general questions, I suppose that would be appropriate here. Or if we want to jump into the software and look at some things, we could do that too. With that, I'd just like to point out that this software and the accompanying guide are available for download at the URL you see on your screen rightrisk.org under the Right Risk Analytics tab. Uh, it's available free of charge and again provides several different examples that you can use to get started with the software. Uh, with that, I thank you very much for your time. I hope I've offered a few things for you to think about. Uh, if you want to contact me for more information or for assistance in using it, 
You may do so with the email address or at the phone number listed on the screen. So again, thank you.